Well, I'm Brendan Selleck, a mud horse fisherman on the west coast of Somerset, Bridgewater Bay. We've been, the, the family been doing this fishing for generations here and I'm just one that carried it on and now I've finished and Adrian's doing it. The son, he's doing it and he, well, he's been doing it for a number of years, but um, we're the last people that's actually doing it. But when I first started 60 odd years ago, there was, um, oh, there was a dozen people doing it and uh, different, Ernie Stone and Clifford Brewer and a, a number of them, 60 years ago. And it, over that period, now it, it died right down to the, just the last 30 years, we've been the only ones doing it. So with a bit of luck, Adrian and brother still keep, hopefully to do it, if he can make a living good enough. But that's been the problem over the years. It's so many people used to do it, but I, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be viable now these days which was a shame really, back years ago was more of, the, you never had so many imports and all that of uh, everything in the supermarket, you can buy from all parts, corners of the world, whereas fishing down on the coast, like places like this, it was quite a little tasty thing to come out and have some shrimp or whatever we was catching at the time. Yeah, and could you just explain um, for those who don't know, because uh, it's mud horse fishing, it's not regular fishing. Oh no, it's a, it's a peculiar, that, that's why we, here in this uh, Bridgewater Bay, we, we've been doing the mud horse way, it's an old tradition, it's just a simple device, but it's very effective, and we've never been able to improve on it, we've just, it, the, the mud horse been used here for literally hundreds of years. Well, in, I'm the fifth, gen the fourth, fifth generation of the Sulliks, and of course, long before that, fishing was going on by different families. But we've been here all those, all those uh, generations, and uh, we never we use the same now in 2011 as what they did in 1711. The the mud oars got developed here. It's just a simple, simple uh, um, gadget that. Uh, was devised by somebody hundreds of years ago and it's been very effective ever since and we still use it right up to this day. Could, Mar you, could you just describe the techniques you use? So, so well, you, you lie on the mud horse from behind and pedal with your feet and that enables you to skither across the mud, just slide across the mud and um, take all the weight. You can put several hundred weight on the mud horse if, if you've got a good catch and, and you can still get it back to the shore but on the mud. But whereas if you try to, without the mud horse, you just sink and disappear or, or you fall over, you just couldn't carry anything at all because the mud's too deep and you get in a terrible mess and everything. Whereas you can pack it all on the mud horse, paddle away and you, it's hard work, but once you've got the knack of it, whoa, it, this, this, it, that's the idea. Very good. Because you said it's um, your fifth generation. Fourth, yeah. Fifth. It's, um, how did you first get into it? And did you well, know my, you were going to do that? Yeah, I, I left school at 14 and went straight on doing it. And I've been doing it ever since. And now I'm 70, 76, 77. And uh, my father did it all his life. His father, my grandfather, he did it all his life. And he took it on from his father. They started in about 1820, the Selleks. But of course, there was a lot of other families uh, long well before then and, and, and since like, but uh, we, we're just the last ones that's doing it now in this Bridgewater estuary and, and the only part in the world where it's done with the mud horse. And so have you got records of um, when the business first started up then? Or? Well, yes, no, only by handed down record really. We have old photographs and all that, but um, yeah, my, I'm the fifth, uh, in about 1820 we can go back to when the one the old salad came here from he, he used to be um uh uh steeplejack and uh, that he he was in the building trade and he came down on the shore and picked up with a fisher girl that and that's she said well give up your trade because you can get more money here and that's how he came here fishing in 1920 1820 1830 and he, and he took it on and then that's we're the end product here five generations old yeah. 2011 and you said you started doing it when you were 14 is yeah that, did you never stopped i did haven't you, stopped is that when you would have finished school then or yeah, that, left, yeah left at 14 and went i went you used to go fishing long before then of course when, when i was at school all days and weekends 
<clears throat> I remember my father taking me out in the basket, putting me in a basket and going out, and um, I'd wait for him, and uh, he shivered at me, bring it, ch chuck his overcoat over me and uh, to keep me warm, because I go blue with the cold. And uh, ever since I was a little toddler, I remember I can remember as if it was yesterday going out, he pushing me out on the mud horse. Yeah, like we done with our children as they grew, when they were left school holidays, not they used to come out and on the summer days, really nice, right out in the estuary. Is you get muddy and but you can go in a pool of water and soon wash it all off. And it sounds like you've got fond memories back then. Because yeah. Because it's a kind of a family business. Do you find that um, it doesn't feel as much like work? No, that's it. No, you wouldn't want to do anything else once you... Once we've been doing it, because they did say for 50 years ago, the nuclear power station people, we started complaining about we thought it was the fact of doing the fishing. And they said, well, it probably will, but um, why don't you come out here and work with us? We, you can have, and they offered everybody, we, I could have went out, but we at the time, we, want, we was, we've been used to doing this and I didn't want to move. And, you know, I probably, Probably financially, I might have been better off had I went out there and been paid off like a lot of the others when you've done your 30 years. But um, no, we did. We just kept doing it and still doing it to this day. Uh, of course, there were several families that did take the offer and never came back. That's partly why it got dissolved here. We was the only ones that kept it going. So it's the nuclear power stage. Because um, that's got to be one of the things that have changed the most. Oh, yeah, the nuclear, yeah. yeah. It's such a massive change. Well, it, it came here when... It, 50 years ago, they were out there just after the war drilling, and we every the rumour was that they were going to drill for oil because there was before the war, there was going to be a railroad put right through West Somerset because they was going to convert the shell into oil right along this coast. Well, we thought it was to do with that, drilling for oil, but it wasn't. It was to drill, and, they've, and then they come out to say, oh, well, it's absolutely suitable for a nuclear station because of the rock, form, the th very thickness of the rock and everything stable. And that's how it came. And, and the nuclear got developed 45, 50 years ago. And um, like some of the old fishermen finished up getting the jobs there, and they never came back to do this. But of course, we, we just hung in there and we're still doing it to this day. But like I just said, we've been probably better off had we got well-paid jobs. But um, it's, it gets in your blood, this fishing with the shrimps. And the, you never know what you're going to catch. And it's something different all the time. Every day it's different. Could, could you talk about, like, kind of, uh, in terms of just roughly a typical day, like, well, we, we, we have to leave here about three hours, two and a half hours to low water, enabling us to get out to the nets and get, do the work, get the shrimps out the nets, clean the nets out, and before the tide turns, to come back in again. And then we, depending on the time of the year, what catch we get, but we do, sometimes we have a really good catch, and we might have a week of good catches, and then you might have a week of gales and bad weather, and uh, you don't get very much. But you have to put up with that, take the good with the bad. But we do catch all sorts of fish here, from a dober sole to a skate. Um, in the winter it's cod, white bait, sprats, whiting, dober sole. You mentioned it, but there's all kinds that comes up this Br Bristol Channel. We don't catch it in large quantities, but we do catch it. And the ones, what we do catch is, in, is always in good condition. Excellent fish. Yeah. yeah. And also with the, the nuclear power station, because you were concerned, oh, yeah. has it changed? Uh, oh, yeah. We, we definitely, as affected this uh, over the 40 years, the diluted the stocks. Where we used to send, for instance, shrimps all over the country um, and on the rail, and uh, they used to come and pick it up. We used to catch them by the ton. In a in a few weeks, we we'd only catch a hundred weight now. I reckon there's ninety percent less than when the, sixty years ago. And there was quite a lot of fishermen before the nuclear station. The the shrimps that's caught in this bay was colossal, very very uh, massive uh, for shrimp. But uh, this last few years, over the last forty years, they've got. 
They've gradually been diluted now. Instead of catching a ton in a number of months, we, we'd only catch 100 weights. Yeah, and then in terms of like going through, like how do you sort the fish out when you've got a load? Like how does, that must well, we, we put it in nets and baskets and bring it back into, and, and well, Adrian shorts it out out there. And then when we come back in here, we just sort it out and put it in, in certain lots, wash it two or three times and boil the shrimps chuck them into the reaps, into the baskets to cool off. And then um, hopefully we, in the summertime, there's always people here that we get rid of it, sell it. And are most of them still alive when you go yeah, out the baskets? Yeah, all, all alive, yeah. yeah. Especially the shrimp, they have to be alive before when we cook, so to keep them in good condition. Yeah. And it is, um, like, do you get any kind of, are some fish more difficult to handle than others? Yes, it, it, the mullet and bass, you've got to be careful how you pick them up because of the spikes on the back. They're very nasty if you, uh, you've got to handle them carefully because the spikes, if they go in your finger, you, they really pay, very painful. Yeah, and, and, and the congrails, and we get a bit of all sorts. Do you, are there any kind of fish that, like, no one wants as a product, so you have to... Well, it used to be, but now the more or less all the fish we catch, there's a there's a market for. What about Some, jellyfish? No, I, no, we can't sell we can't sell them. Although I have seen, I have heard that they do make use, but no, we've never been able to sell them. And we do catch them even in quantity in, in the very hot weather. Yeah. You know, they come up with the sharks and the dogfish and things like that. The jellyfish. And they, they can be, they, we, they call them the, um, uh, cool. um, the man of war. Poor, uh, God, I can't think now. Anyway, they're... The dangerous they're, one, right? Eh? Is that the dangerous one? That yes, they, they come up in thousands of them, all up the channel in the hot weather. Um, man of war, Portuguese man of war, they call them. And they, they, you can't pick them up because they're, they're dangerous. They sting. Although you get them transparent, you can lift them up. Sometimes they're so big as a, big as a basket, when, but mostly they're small ones. Yeah. Yeah. Did, you, did you get any kind of peculiar kind of rare fish? Did you ever caught any weird rare fish or well, we octopus have, or octopus? Oh or yeah, we have had odd ones. Yeah. And squid, octopus, cuttlefish, sturgeon. We once had a sturgeon, my father, seven foot long. Oh. Yeah, beauty he was. I always regret my father. He said, no, don't be so silly. Sit on him and have your photo took. And uh, being only a four-year-old, I was too scared because he was still, he was breathing. His gills was going like this and I was scared. And, but I always regret it ever since because we got photographs of the sturgeon. He actually breathing. But if I'd have been sat on him as a three or four year old, because I was about three, I think, it was 1937 when he caught it. Yeah, incredible. Beautiful fish. He went, he, he went through the nets two or three days running, and uh, the, on the, uh, the following day, my father, he, was, he heard this noise, and it was him tangled up in the net. He brought him in alive. Well, you found your nets all destroyed. Yeah, because he oh. used to come in, because he's a big animal. It's so 100, 100 pounds, is seven foot long. Yeah. Yeah, but of course, this rose sturgeon was never caught very rarely, it was ever in British waters. And, and the, the royal palace, if they wanted it, they would have it. What's that? The, called the rose sturgeon because they're so scarce to catch in English waters, it was absolute scarcity. That if needed, the ro it was, belonged to the queen. Or the king. Yeah. The same as uh, what's the fish that caviar. Caviar. ah caviar the, the 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 sturgeon is the one with the caviar rags inside, and um, what's the other one that were the, the famous for for all the royals Henry the Eighth and I always used to have them from the River Severn. Um, I can't think of the name now. Those eels suck wow. lamprey. Oh, lamprey, like an eel with beautiful, beautiful markings on it. And it's, they, we still catch them. They still catch them out the Severn, but uh, hundreds of years ago, it was a, it was a top delicacy and uh, to just a royalty and very, uh, very expensive. 
and they were caught specially for them. But they do still catch them, the lamprey, marvellous animal, really. Yeah. Oh, so what's your, what's they your suck, they, they, they swim along and suck on to another fish and live on that fish until they've had their fill and they, they release themselves. That's just a big leech or something. A big leech. Uh -huh. And he might be that long. But he, we, uh, we catch fish now, uh, we catch fish that got, got the, were even stuck on. Uh. Uh, what's it like um, living out with your, because uh, I assume you've always lived here then? Yeah. And well, with, with your family, as well. yeah. what's that like in Somerset? Oh, well you've got a job to beat it, haven't you, Somerset, I think. Well, not that we ever went too far, but especially when I was young, we, we was always working and always here, but um, the last number of years I've, we've had a few holidays, but you, I think you'd have a job to beat this area, Somerset. In, it's as good a place as anywhere in the world, really, I would have thought. Where'd you go for your holidays then, if you're already by it? Well, I, we never went for, it was only the last few years I've been out. We've had a couple of cruises, been to Scotland, been over to Germany, but just a few like everybody else, Spain and that, just the last few years. But I, we never went for 40 years because we, we couldn't afford it. We had too many children. That's <laughs> oh, so just a big family then? Yeah. Oh, cool. well, you, you Nine of us. Yeah. Mum and dad, and seven, and you couldn't very well take seven kids into an old tower. It cost a fortune. Uh, and has all, has all of them uh, got involved in the, the fishing business? Yeah, they or? have uh, over the years, yes. But Adrian, he, he's the one who, who's doing it, and these two boys to do it, in and out. But of course, they, they, uh, they want their car and have regular money, so they got a job as well. But they help out in and out. But uh, it's just only a one-man business. It's a pity if it ever dies away. It'd be nice for it to carry on if it's possible. But because um, it's so uh, old England, and um, it's uh, the the last thing that was happening here. And in this Bridgewater estuary, the, it used to be all the way round from Stoford in this part, right the way round to Bermond Sea, West and Supermare, and across the other side to Cardiff Bay. Cardiff Bay, they used to do exactly the same, uh, with a mud horse and all. But it, that, that, finished, uh, that finished years and years ago. Yeah. And so do you, it's mainly because there's a supermarket center. Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. You, in, well, if you go back years ago, you see, only 20 or 30 years ago, there wasn't any supermarkets. Especially through the war, food was scarce, so it was always a good demand for locally caught, like, marine fish and all that kind of thing. There's a big demand for it. But now, 2011, you've got five or six supermarkets in every town, and they can bring in stuff from all the corners of the world. You can go in into your supermarket and buy anything from, from Japan to wherever. But that wasn't the case years ago. There wasn't those luxuries. You wouldn't... I mean, you, there's fruits and all that you can get now, but that never, that wasn't the case a few, not a few years ago. And so it probably was seen as a bit of a delicacy back then, was it? Oh, delicacy, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was a big delicacy. And there was such a shortage of food, especially through the war and years after the war, that uh, they used to come down to the... Because this, this Bristol Channel used to be a very good place for herrings. The massive amount of herrings used to be caught from Mynead to Ilfracombe to Lynmouth, and we used to catch them up here, and anchovies and pilchards. Well, all that is gone. A shame, really. There was thousands of people that used to be involved catching pilchards, anchovies, and sprats, and herrings in particular, herrings. And they used to come round all around the town shouting out, buy my errands, uh, pound for 50 or whatever it was. Yeah. So, so what are your customers like now? Like, who, who well, we, no, we, we just rely on it. We, I suppose we make a living because it, everything's got up so expensive that we don't have to catch too much fish to make your wages. You know what I mean? That the, the, the price is good. And... It, there's not that many people about, but the older generation still likes to ring up and come down and get some shrimps 
or a Dover sole or a live ale because they just can't buy that. Though you've got a supermarket, you, there is things that you can't get. You never see shrimps in a supermarket. You see prawns. You see Chinese or Norwegian prawns, don't you? Full of water. But you don't get the brown shrimp. So that's something we got here that they can't get anywhere else. And then also you're talking about like the, the live eels. Like in, uh, live how eels. How do you deal with them? Yeah, you just tell oh, them well, that. that's it. They, they've always been a... They've always been a delicacy with certain people. You know, you go some places, they wouldn't look at them, but there is certain pair, especially in the East End of London and that, they, they really go well for. There's a big demand. When, and we've got a lot of retired people down here. And, um, yeah. Oh, and the, what? Seaweed. Oh, yeah, seaweed, yeah, oh, that's it. Yeah, we used to eat that. A lot of people eat that. See, like we... the vegetarian yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's nice, man. We yeah, yeah, you, very good. Do you think um probably having a lot of fish like yourself um, in storage has it kept you healthy? Is it a good diet? I think it is really, because yeah. <laughs> I've always eaten fish and seaweed. I've been out fishing for when I was a kid. I used to eat a lot of seaweed because I was that hungry. If I didn't take a barge, I'd, I'd get the seaweed and eat eat a lot of it. Yeah, I think it's good for you. And we have the brown laver with the fish. Yeah, brown laver, the lather, lather bread, but the brown laver, the green and the brown, you can, you can mix it up in, uh, and, and fry it with bacon and eggs, and it's really lovely. A lot of people eat it now all through this area, and especially on the Welsh side and North Devon, there's a lot of lather, they call it lather bread. It's seaweed mixed with oatmeal, and chucked in the frying pan with the bacon and eggs. And it's really tasty. Yeah, very good. People got too much money, see, because years ago they used to come down to places like this and scavenge for it. You still get a few of the old ones to it, but they, they're people's too, uh, got too much money. They're not hungry enough. Whereas they used to come down to these coastal areas and from up in the villages, and come down to pick up the little crabs and uh, the little little mussels and uh, limpets and, and the brown label, like I said. Still very eatable now. That, in that great big house over there, there used to be an old family of farmers that retired, and every Sunday their, their um, delicacy was a nice big dish of crabs. They'd go out in the rock pools and pick up the little crabs come back and boil them in salt, sea water, salt and water, and they the lovely colour, the crab, red, and, and then they'd have them for their Sunday tea with bread and butter, and put a, have a sauce to dip them in, and eat the whole lot. Little crab, is only about that big, quite eatable, very tasty, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Some... But of course, they, the people would turn their nose up to it now, see, wouldn't they? Would you think... Uh... I mean, uh, that's a whole interesting issue because in terms of like who owns the fish and who is the nets are out like do you own the bit of land that the nets go out no or? we just take we we have the right because we've been doing it for so long and they we we just get a license to do it and we we we're the only ones in this particular area that does it well it's only right really because if somebody just think well i'll go out and do it then they, they would dilute the, there'd be too many you, there wouldn't be anything for anybody. Yeah. And it's, um... They'd come when it was plentiful and leave it when there was nothing. You know, we, whereas we do it all the year round. We have to take the rough with the smooth and uh, that's how it is. Well, I was going to ask, because of the kind of nature of the job and like kind of depending on nature, do you think that you have to develop a certain kind of... Uh personality or character? Yeah, I, uh, yeah I think so, yeah, because most people wouldn't want... On a really hot summer's day, you couldn't be anywhere better than out there in the sun and the sea and the lovely fresh air. But when the winter and the bad weather comes, the people, that, that'd be it. They, that, they won't want to know. No. And so just as my final question, have you got any uh, grandchildren that are gonna be, have got those characteristics? To well, I, yeah, I think so. They, some of them have kind of gone to it, I suppose. Like, my father was the youngest of his ten, ch 
brothers. He was the youngest who took it on from his father. Well, now I was the only one who took it on from my father. So Adrian's got several children, so one of them is sure to take it on if he can make a living out of it. And of course he might not. They might sort of, and it would be a shame for it. In, in years to come, the, the governments in, in, might give grants or something for to try to keep these old people going. Like, we've always been so sustainable, but if, if you had a government grant or something to help, which I feel that's what will happen, rather than let it die away, they might do something like that. English nature or something might be able to sort of give them, help them along with a grant just to buy the equipment and help them on. Well, it does my brother. I've got a work permit nice. Ah. Otherwise, I could do it. No. It's ah. Enough to keep father ticket. Yeah. Oh, okay. But now, if they could, in future times, they, they might be able to do something like that. Because they've done it with all, a lot of things, haven't they? Farming and all that's been all um, subsidised. The small units on the eel tops and things like that, that couldn't... They, all through the years, they've been able to add a bit of subsidy. So maybe they might be able to help future people to do this, carry it on. Carry it on. So it's got a hopeful future then? Yeah, that's it, yeah. yeah. Like fishing now, with being handed down as a skill, what's been handed down, which I wouldn't have known unless I had handed it to No, me. that's it. You've got to read the mud, the tide, yeah. how to position the nets. Didn't know people going out there put it that way because you won't catch nothing. No. You've got to work the put in a certain way. Yeah. The skills, like I say, you've got to read the mud, how the mud is, so you can see the fish in the mud, you know what I mean? The, the telltale marks of what's about, like the mullet, I scoop the mud out, you know, mm. different things like that, so you know, yeah. oh, we'll put those nets down, mm. and catch that Pacific fish this week or whatever. Because all, all the thousands of mud acres out here, there's so, the, my father used to, when we were going across, he'd say, oh, look, cool, oh, they're in there, look. The Tilbur souls would come in, or the skate would come in, where they'd, they, they get, by the markings on the mud, you knew what kind of fish come, was coming in. Perhaps a month before, there was no sign of them. And then all of a sudden, oh, they, they're in, look, they'd come in, and then put a net down to catch him, like. But you have to do that through the knowledge of, over the years. And it's important to pass on that knowledge. Yeah, it is really, yeah. But you haven't got to pass it on to too many because if too many went and done it, they'd, they'd just go there when, the, when there was abundance and they'd just go and cream it all off. And then when there wasn't not very much, say, well, I'm going out there, I can't earn enough at it. But, so but we do it thick and thin through the year, right the way around the year. and we. Sometimes we don't earn next to nothing, and then you have to take the good times with the bad times. And, uh, a lot of people want to go out there and get covered in mud. No. Everybody's clean out there. Yeah. Like you know, a guy coming out to make waste covered in mud. Yeah. Yeah. You know, get the point. Yeah. It's a dirty way of living, but everybody's clean. They go into a factory now, put an overall on, and that's the end of it. And yeah. The day they take it off and they're clean. Yeah. Going out there, you're covered in muck. <laughs> yeah. But of course, he wouldn't like to. Somebody say, you can't do that ever again. He, he, you've been brought up. And you, it's really interesting and lovely out there. Beautiful out there in the summer. Well, in the winter, we like it when it's cold because you wrap up well. Because we're right out in the bowls of the channel. It's like in a different planet you are, especially when the mist come down and that. It's completely different. Everybody that's been out there say, cool, wow, it's fantastic out here. It's a certain time of the year when the... And of course, when the fog comes down in November time, you, you've got to be extra careful because uh, many people have lost their lives. We're out there two miles in the channel, and if you, if you lose your bearings, or if we have a lot of rain like we have last night, the mud gets saturated, and you don't know whether you're in the tide or on the mud because there's so much water that... It's like a billiard table of thousands of acres and the, the water is flooding in from down on the hills and you don't know where you are, so you have to be very careful. You can't take liberties with it. No, it's, it's very dangerous. See, there's that two chaps down at Burnham there. They, we used to often see them out there. They only done it as a part-time, but they were always out there fishing. And they, this particular Sunday morning, 
uh, they rang up somebody and they said, you haven't seen them? I said, yeah, I've seen them out there. Anyway, they, what they'd done, they was out behind where we fish and they must have um, tripped up or caught their hand, leg in the net or something and got tossed overboard. And then I expect the son or the father went for to save the son and perhaps he got dragged in too. And they got snarled in the nets and nobody found them for all three weeks till the tide went right down, that low bottom tide, and they was all in the bottom of the snarled up. Were they? So and then over the years that kind of thing have happened. So you've got to, there's always the, the high risk of taking, you can't take liberties. It's very, because the tide's moving so fast. Yeah. You know, in the river, you, you've seen them in the river, haven't you? The, the tide come in so much, so fast, and come in behind you. Something like at Morecambe Bay, you see back Fuchs, all those Chinese, they thought they were trying to earn a few bob, and uh, little did they think that the tide came in behind them and uh, lost all their life, didn't they? It sounds like a job where you need the experience. Well, yeah, you've got, you can't take liberties with it, no. Not an experienced person is still vulnerable to, well, we know you are in every walk of life, but out there you, you wouldn't have a second chance because the tide comes in and you'll be gone.